Dr. Prachi from Shield Healthcare. Today we have eminent speaker, uh, Dr. S uh, Selvaraj. Uh, welcome, ma'am. And uh, thank you for accepting our invitation uh, from us and uh, being with us. Uh, Dr. Yelini Salvaraj Mam is MD, TGO, FISCOG, and uh, received advanced training in reproductive medicine from Germany. Mam is chief consultant, gynecologist, and IVF specialist, and also managing director of uh, Madurai Pony Fertility and Research Center. Mam will give us a talk on infertility in PCOS. So, with this, may I request and welcome Mam to give a talk on PCOS and infertility. So over to you, Mark. Thank you very much. Okay. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Good evening. At the outset, I would like to thank the organizers, Dr. Prachi and Dr. Mr. Saravanan, for giving me this opportunity, and he, the health, the health pharma, uh, for giving me this opportunity to deliver my speech on. Um, polycystic ovarian syndrome and infertility. These are the contents under which I'm going to discuss. That is introduction, incidence, pathophysiology, clinical features, investigations, and the treatment modalities. First, it was in 1935 that STEAM, FL, and Lenthal, Leventhal, ML, uh, they found the association of amenorrhea with bilateral polycystic ovaries, and it was uh, published in American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Seven women with a variety of clinical symptoms, obesity, hirsutism, acne, amenorrhea, were associated with enlarged bilateral ovaries. And uh, in uh, Italian literature, it weighs back to uh, 1721, where they have mentioned about this polycystic ovaries. So it's a heterogeneous multisystem endocrinopathy in women of reproductive age, chronic annulation resulting in infertility, irregular bleeding, obesity, and hirsutism. The most common cause that is the androgen excess, but it is least understood. What are the diagnostic criteria to diagnose a PCOS? In 1990, the National Institute of Health, they coined that oligoovulation and hyperandrogenism or hyperandrogenemia with the exclusion of other related disorders are the criteria to diagnose PCOS. And in 2003, the Rotterdam criteria jointly by Eshray and ASRM, they said that at least two out of three of the following should be present to diagnose PCOS. Oligo or anovulation, clinical or biochemical signs of hyperandrogenism, polycystic ovaries with exclusion of other related disease. And in 2009, the Androgen Excess Society said that hyperandrogenism with hirsutism and or hyperandrogenemia and ovarian dysfunction with oligoovulation, oligo or anovulation and or polycystic ovaries uh, should be uh, there to diagnose PCOS. This is a diagrammatic representation of polycystic ovarian syndrome where the ovaries are enlarged. There are multiple peripheral cystic follicles which fail to mature due to increased androgens. There is premature follicle atresia and on ultrasound, we'll be seeing more than 12 follicles, small two to nine millimeters in size and peripherally situa situated with a thick stroma. 
and the ovaries are usually enlarged. There will be endometrial hyperplasia also. So the incidence is around four to six percent of women are affected. The incidence is fast increasing due to change in lifestyle and stress. Most common cause of anovulation, and it is around 20 to 25 percent where the normal ovulation also demonstrate ultrasound findings typical of polycystic ovaries. 20 to 26 percent of women in India suffer from PCOS. And it is a leading cause of infertility. It affects 5 to 10 percent of women in their reproductive years. This is the diagrammatic representation of uh, a normal ovary and that of a polycystic ovary. WHO estimated that PCOS affects 116 million women globally. And in India, the prevalence of PCOS is reported between 3.7 to 22.5 percent with a 9.13 to 36 percent prevalence in only adolescents. PCOS, it becomes an epidemic in Bangalore city due to the lifestyle that people have adapted. And India and insulin resistance play a key role in the pathogenesis of PCOS. And Indians are known to have high prevalence of insulin resistance, hence the prevalence of PCOS is expected to be high in Indian population. And uh, Times City from Kolkata published that rice triggers polycystic ovary in young women. About 50% of women in the age group of 15 to 30 in Kolkata suffer from PCOS. And there is increased ovarian androgen production, mainly due to enhanced androgen synthesis by follicular thecal cells. 20 to 30 percent of patients also show adrenal androgen excess, suggesting adrenocortical hyperfunction. And this shows the uh, world distribution of PCOS phenotype prevalence. And each country and continent has its own phenotypic prevalence. In South Asians, there is severe hirsutism, there is lowered sex hormone binding globulin and high free androgen index, more of insulin resistance, higher prevalence of acanthosis nigricans, lower BMI, but higher central fat. The pathophysiology, etiology of PCOS is unknown, but there is increasing evidence to support the view that complex endocrine trait contribution of several genes and jointly uh, environmental and nutritional factors also act to produce PCOS, which is the root cause for abnormal ovarian steroidogenesis. There is hypersecretion of LH. 40% of patients have an increased LH, which leads on to menstrual disorders and infertility. There is increased ovarian androgen production and direct interference with oocyte maturation. All this affects the ovulation, brings down the ovulation rate and the implantation and pregnancy rates in ART cycles, but the abortion rate goes up. Before going into uh, the proper insulin resistance in periphery should be understood by us. As we eat food, the food with carbohydrates is uh, di digested to produce glucose, which triggers the beta cells of uh, the pancreas to produce insulin. And this insulin helps in the utilization of glucose by the tissues. But in insulin resistance, the receptor problem or the insulin is ineffective in promoting the utilization of the glucose by the cells. So the cells starve in spite of plenty of glucose. There is poverty in plenty. So this starving cells, they trigger the appetite and the patient with PCOS takes more amount of food, resulting in obesity as well as in hyperinsulinemia. But this is not the thing that is happening in the ovary because the ovaries, they never experience the insulin resistance. The more amount of glucose is utilized by the ovaries and they get enlarged and they produce a lot of immature follicles resulting in polycystic ovary. 
here, most of the policies take over in syndrome people suffer from obesity. That's the root, root cause for insulin resistance. And uh, this results in hyperinsulinemia with the liver producing less amount of sex hormone binding globulin and increasing amount of insulin-like growth factor. There is also a reduction in the insulin-like growth factor one binding protein. All these things contribute to hyperandrogenemia. The LH level also goes up. Obesity and the increased LH produces an ovulation. And all this will cause the ovaries to enlarge. Why does PCOS lead to infertility? Normally, you should have ovulation, fertilization, then implantation of the fertilized zygote, and uh, um, there should be pregnancy with fetal viability and birth of a healthy born baby. But in PCOS, because of the poor oozite quality, the ovulation and fertilization are affected, and the endometrial receptivity goes down because of the endometrial hyperplasia. So implantation is affected and hyperinsulinemia and gestational diabetes and hypertension will affect the delivery of a healthy live born baby. The endocrinological changes or there is, estrogen is high than the E2 level. LH level is also raised over 10 international units per ml. FSH level remains normal LH and FSH ratio is more than three. The sex hormone binding globulin level falls due to hyperandrogenism. Testosterone and epiandrogenism levels go up. The thyroid function test may be abnormal. That is, there may be hypothyroidism. And cytochrome P450, C17, a multifunctional enzyme that converts C21 steroids to C19 sex steroid precursor results in DHEA, which goes up. So here, usually androgens from the thico cells will be converted into estrogen by the action of FSH. But in PCOS, due, due to aromatization, but, but in PCOS, because the LH value is more than FSH, uh, the thicker cells can't have the aromatization properly. There is aromatization defect, which increases the intra ovarian androgen level that interferes with the follicular maturity, resulting in anovulation and infertility. Now let's see the clinical presentations. These are all the 10 signs and symptoms of PCOS. There is usually irregular periods or absence of menstruation, excess of facial hair and bodily hair, but the scalp hair may be thinning or loss of scalp hair, abnormal skin discoloration. Patients may have obesity, acne, and high blood pressure, depression, and stress. Obesity is seen more among young women with central obesity, the BMI will be more than 10, 30. It is present in 50% of patients with PCOS. 10% may express type two diabetes mellitus. There is hyperinsulinemia present in more than 50% of patients with PCOS. This feature present in both obese as well as in lean patients. 87% will exhibit oligo Menorrhea, 26% will have amenorrhea and usually followed with a heavy periods. Dysmenorrhea is absent, 20% have infertility and pregnancy loss is seen among 20 to 30%. The acanthosis nigricans and obstructive sleep apnea may be also presented. Here you could see the acanthosis nigricans, the hirsutism, that is uh, the hair over the face and acne. Now we'll see what the treatment for hirsutism. Acne can be managed by 1% clindamycin solution or 2% erythromycin gel if pustules are forming. 
For severe acne, isotretinoin is used, must be avoided in pregnancy. Three to six months post may be needed to have an effective effect over the hirsutism. Antiandrogens like cyprotin acetate, spironolactone, flutamide can be given for hirsutism. Dexamethasone 0.5 milligram at bedtime reduces the androgen production and is used in some infertile people with clomiphene citrate if the DHEA is more than five nanogram per ml. Antiandrogens used in PCOS will prevent further hair growth, but the hair which had already grown have to be treated by epilation, waxing, by electrolysis or laser treatment. One of my patients had severe hirsutism that she has to shave her face daily. And this uh, depicts the spectrum of PCOS from childhood to post-menopause. I would like to note that, um, point that in puberty, the PCOS and non-PCOS will have similar features like acne, increase in the ovarian volume, irregular menstrual cycles, and insulin resistance of puberty. So both will be almost sailing in the same boat. So we should be very careful to differentiate whether the um, very puberty, that is uh, youngsters, are really suffering from PCOS. But in reproductive and postmenopausal women, almost their, the differentiation can be uh, well predicted. Now let's move on to the differential diagnosis. The causes of oligo or anovulation. We have to rule out hyperthyroidism, hypothyroidism, hyperprolactinemia, hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism. And for hyperandrogenism, uh, the late onset of uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia should be taken in, should be uh, thought of. And uh, androgen secreting ovarian tumors, androgen secreting adrenal tumors, Cushing syndrome, exogenous androgen use, all to be taken as differential diagnosis. So to differentiate, we have to do serum levels of FSH, LH, TSH, total uh, testosterone level, prolactin, DHEAS, 17 hydroxy progesterone, two hourly GTT, lipid profile, and we have to measure the BMI, waist circumference, and BP. Now let's move on to the management of how to manage PCOS. PCOS and infertility. Approximately 90 to 95% of anovulatory women uh, reporting to infertility clinics have PCOS. The infertility is seen in 40% of women with PCOS. And uh, spontaneous abortion is seen more frequently in PCOS with incidence ranging from 42 to 73%. What are the challenges when we treat a 20 to 40 year old PCOS patient? The women worry about infertility, early pregnancy loss. During pregnancy, they are worrying about pregnancy induced hypertension and uh, gestational diabetes mellitus. What does the doctor worry about? She worries about poor ovarian function, poor rosite quality and maturation, high insulin level and high androgen levels. So the strategies to optimize the fertility is to achieve proper weight loss. Then the use of insulin sensitizers. Then we have to go for ovulation induction drugs, laparoscopic ovarian drilling, and the last resort is assisted reproductive technology. So the goal of management is to cure a woman with menstrual disorders, to treat the hirsutism, which we have already dealt with, to treat infertility, to prevent long-term effect of X syndrome in later life. So the management comprises of non-pharmacological, pharmacological and surgical management. The non-pharmacological therapy is weight loss weight loss of at least five to seven percent of previous weight loss. 
alone is beneficial in mild hirsutism. It restores the hormonal milieu. It increases the secretion of sex hormone binding globulin from liver, thereby reducing the testosterone level, reduces the insulin level, and lifestyle modification, cessation of smoking is all that is advocated. This is how to reduce the weight. See, for every increase of one unit in BMI, will result in 9% increased risk of developing PCOS. So as the BMI goes up, the chances for becoming a, a severe PCOS patient is also going up. So there is, a, um, because of the excess weight, there is ovulatory dysfunction, infertility, the quality of oocyte and embryo also goes down. There is increased insulin resistance. There is in increased androgen activity and um, the worsened cardiovascular and diabetes mellitus risk factors. There is also worsened psychological function. All these things will reduce the ART success. So the facts are obese women have three times more likely infertility versus the normal women. And 80% of PCOS have increased BMI. The fertility rate uh, goes up four times with the BMI unit. When the BMI unit goes up, the fertility rate will also get reduced. Uh, central obesity reduces the consumption by 30% per cycle for each 0.1 increase in the waist hip ratio. The follicular fluid insulin and androgen levels correlate with BMI in obese infertile women, even in absence of PCOS. An increase in BMI results in increased androgens with premature follicular atresia that causes a reduction in the follicular maturation, which will produce anovulation and infertility. In obese patients, there is increase in the adipokines, leptin, tumor necrotizing factor alpha and interleukin-6, which antagonize the effect of insulin and insulin resistance is produced, which has a negative effect on the oocyte development and the embryo development and also on the endometrial receptivity. So how to tackle it? Diet, exercise. If patient is grossly obese, then you can advise bariatric surgery. But pharmacological treatment and bariatric surgery are not recommended for ovulation induction. The weight loss is the first line of therapy in obese women with PCOS. Then we'll look on the lifestyle modification. The nutrition, the ideal diet plan for women with PCOS should compose of balanced meals, including carbohydrate, proteins, and fat. Eat small meals at regular intervals and avoid large meals, which would result in a rise in the blood glucose levels. Consume fruits, vegetables, beans, legumes, whole grains, fish, lean meat, and nuts and seeds. Limit sugars and enriched carbohydrates. Limit salt intake and avoid saturated fats. So about diet, we have another session with when Dr. Priya will be dealing them uh, nicely. So exercise, how much exercise should we do? 150 minutes per week. Ideally, 30 minutes per day is recommended for PCOS. Walking, swimming, weightlifting, and yoga. Dancing, all these things will help to reduce weight. Bariatric surgery should be considered an experimental therapy in women with PCOS for the purpose of having healthy baby with the risk of benefit ratios currently too uncertain to advocate this as a fertility therapy. But the most uh, thing is that uh, the, we have to avoid pregnancy uh, when during the period of rapid weight loss for at least 12 months after the bariatric surgery. If suppose pregnancy occurs, 
monitoring the pre and post operative nutritional deficiencies and monitoring of the fetal growth during pregnancy were a must so what are the drugs that are available we have the selective estrogen receptor modulators clomiphenacetate tamoxifen aromatase inhibitors like letrozole and anastazole and gondotrophins hcg hmg and fsh the treatment options for managing hyperandrogenemia you can have combined oral contraceptive pills antiandrogens pyrinolactone flutamide fenestride glucocorticoids and cyprotrin acetate the treatment options for managing metabolic abnormalities or insulin sensitizing drugs metformin thiazolidinediones like pioglitazone and rosiglitazone dipeptidyl peptidase inhibitors sitagliptin and linagliptin and inositol stereoisomers myonositol and dicaroinositol and glp1 that is gluco glucagon like peptide agonist that is exentanide and uh, liraglutide treatment options for managing metabolic abnormalities again continues the lipid lowering agents like statins and mis miscellaneous drugs opioid receptor antagonist orlistat vitamin d and chromium this will reduce the insulin resistance the glp1 agonist improves the glycemic control while reducing the body weight and maintaining low rates of hypoglycemia in 24 week trials in 60 overweight oligo ovulatory women with pcos aging between 18 to 40 years exenatide was associated with improving menstrual cyclicity in achieving ovulation and to bringing down the free androgen index and making uh, the insulin sensitive and by reducing the weight and abdominal fat now we will see about the inositol stereoisomers they are the dicaroinositol and myonositol which improve the insulin sensitivity and hence are relevant in pcos management improved indices have been described with the use of myonositol in women with pcos which include insulin sensitivity decrease in the serum testosterone level improved spontaneous ovulation and menstrual cyclicity were achieved Additionally there is improvement in the severity of hirsutism which is observed with the treatment with myonositol at the recommended dose of 2 to 4 grams per day myo is well tolerated with minimal safety concerns and incorporation in clinical management paradigms merits consideration hyperinsulinemia is present in approximately 50% of women with pcos 90% of obese women with pcos have insulin resistance and insulin resistance exacerbates the ovulation dysfunction the mainstay of main managing insulin resistance pcos is with insulin sensitizers the commonest drug is metformin which is also reducing the chances of ovogenesis by 75% the dose of 1500 to 1700 mg per day in divided doses is advocated but it may cause some gi side effects this study includes 626 infertile women and uh, they were given clomiphenacetate with placebo another group was uh, getting metformin plus placebo and the third group was getting metformin with clomiphenacetate the metformin with clomiphenacetate had a higher rate of live birth rate that is 26.8% and um, clomiphene is superior to metformin in achieving live birth in infertile women with pcos though the chances for multiple pregnancy is more the inositol that is insulin receptor resides in the cell membrane 
when its B subunit is phosphorylated by insulin, insulin receptor substrates are activated. Phosphoinositol 3 kinase docks to the insulin receptor substrates, which then leads to phosphorylation of phosphatidyl inositol, eventuating in insulin action. It acts as the second messenger uh, in the utilization of insulin. Myoinositol increases uh, insulin sensitivity by making more phosphatidyl inositol available. So this is a meta-analysis where nine um, randomized control trials involving 247 cases and 249 controls were uh, taken into account. And there was a significant decrease in the fasting insulin level significant decrease in the homeostasis model assessment, HOMA index, and a trend of reduction of testosterone concentration. Then a significant increase in the serum sex hormone binding globulin. Within 24 weeks, it was observed. The trial sequential analysis of insulin meta-analysis illustrates a firm evidence of myoinositol. So the beneficial effect of myoinositol in improving the metabolic profile of PCOS women, concomitantly reducing the hyperandrogenism is proved. According to Cochrane Library, it is uh, said that inositol favors live birth rate in PCOS. Now let's see about N-acetylcysteine. It's an acetylated derivative of amino acid L-cysteine. Historic Historically, it has been used as a mucolytic agent in chronic respiratory illnesses. More recently, studies have shown n cysteine to be a powerful antioxidant. n cysteine has been used effectively as an adjuvant to clomiphene citrate for ovulation induction in clomiphene resistant women with PCOS. Um, NAC, it uh, ha, it's a, acts as an insulin sensitizer. It improves the insulin resistance and the insulin receptor activity. It has an anti-apoptotic anti activity and thereby it uh, prevents the follicular atresia. It has a very good antioxidant effect. It increases the cellular levels of reduced glutathione. It preserves the vascular integrity and also shown to have anti-cytokine effect and anti-inflammatory modeling ability. Now let's go to the anovulation, how to tackle an anovulation. According to WHO, um, anovulatory patients are divided into four classes. Class one is hypogonadotrophic hypogonadal anovulation, wherein women have low or low normal uh, serum FSH levels or concentrations and low serum estradiol concentrations due to decreased hypothalamic secretion of gonadotropin releasing hormone or pituitary unresponsiveness to GnRH. And class two is normal gonadotrophic normal estrogenic anovulation where women may secrete normal amounts of gonadotropins and estrogens. However, the FSH, FSH secretion during the follicular phase of the cycle is subnormal. This group includes women with polycystic ovarian syndrome and some ovulate occasionally, especially those with oligomenorrhea. Class three is hypergonadotrophic hypoestrogenic anovulation, where the primary causes are premature ovarian failure or resistant ovarian syndrome. And hyperplatinemia, where the prolactin levels go up, Result inhibiting the ovulation, and uh, that's the cause for anovulation. So this is a multi-step approach to treat anovulatory infertility patients associated with the polycystic ovarian syndrome. The first line is weight loss for high body, uh, body mass index. The first line will comprise of both citrate or as an alternative, letrozole both the cost is low and the chances for multiple pregnancy are not very high. The second line is follicular stimulating hormone injections. Cost is high, 
but uh, the chances for multiple pregnancy is more. And ovarian drilling, when patient is not responding properly to gondotrophin or letrozole and clomiphene, we can advocate ovarian drilling. The cost is high, but chances for multiple pregnancy are not increased. Third line it is in vitro fertilization, cost is very high. And uh, uh, if you transfer only single embryo, then the chances for multiple pregnancy is very low. Then ovulation induction in PCOS, the best practices are, first the BMI had to be tackled with the specific lifestyle modifications at least six months in obese patients. Then you can advocate with clomiphene citrate. And if she is not responding properly, you can add metformin to glomifen citrate. And even with that, if ovulation is not achieved, then gondotrophins can be added. And when you add gondotrophin, um, you can go for a timed intercourse or you can go for a IUI. And if they are not responding to these things, you can go for a ovarian, lab ovarian drilling. In infertile PCOS patients, when cofactors of subfertility are suspected and are diagnosed, we can do a uh, laparoscopic ovarian drilling. Then if you are going for ARTs, you have to advocate the antagon protocols. And either you can do IUI or you can go for IVFN, ICSI, to achieve pregnancy. So now let's see what is laparoscopic uh, ovarian drilling. It is the a second line therapy for women with PCOS who are clomiphene citrate resistant with annulatory infertility and or no other infertility factors. Then it can be offered as a first line therapy also when laparoscopy is indicated for any other reason. And the risk should be explained to all women with PCOS considering laparoscopic ovarian surgery. Where laparoscopic surgery is to be recommended, the following should be considered. The cost should be discussed. They need an expertise uh, that for ovarian induction later. And intraoperative or postoperative risks are higher in obese, overweight PCOS patients. And there may be a small associated risk of lower ovarian reserve or loss of ovarian function. Peri-adenexal adhesions also can form. That is an associated risk. Letrozole, the recommendations for letrozole, it should be considered as the first line pharmacological treatment for ovulation induction. And uh, the health professionals with and women need to be aware that the risk of multiple pregnancy appears to be less with letrozole when compared with that of clomifenzitrate. And how to use letrozole? The dose that is advocated is 2.5 to 5 milligram per day for five days. It usually starts from the second day. The basic ultrasound to be done on the second day where the endometrial thickness should, more, should not be more than five and none of the follicles should be measuring more than one centimeter. So it, uh, the usual um, protocol is second day to sixth day, do an ultrasound on 11th and trigger on the 13th day. Then the extended letrozole protocol, it starts from the first day of periods and goes up to 10th day, then followed with ultrasound exam. Then we have the letrozole step-up protocol where from the, it starts from the second day, one tablet to be given, given on the second day, two on the third day, three tablets on the fourth day, four on the fifth day, and you have to give five tablets on the sixth day, followed with ultrasound. And how to use CC? The dosage is 50 milligram per day for five days. It starts from the second day and it can go up to sixth day or from the third day, we can give up to seventh day or from fourth day up to eighth day and from fifth up to ninth day. Then you have to do ultrasound on the 11th and 13th and trigger, give ovulation trigger to be given. 
if patient is not responding to 50 milligram, you can increase this uh, dosage of uh, clomiphene citrate to either 100 or 150 per day. And you can wait for two or three cycles with the same dose. If suppose the, there is suboptimal endometrial thickness, that is if it's less than seven millimeters, or if ovulation is not, or pregnancy is not achieved, then injectable gondotrophins can be added to this. So the recommendations about clomiphene citrate, it could be used alone, or metformin could be used alone, or in obese patients with more than BMI more than 30, uh, clomiphene citrate could be added to improve ovulation along with metformin to achieve pregnancy and live birth rates. And clomiphene citrate could be combined with metformin rather than persisting with clomiphene citrate alone in women with PCOS who are clomiphene citrate resistant to achieve uh, ovulation and pregnancy. Then gondotrophin therapy is suitable for improving infertility in women with PCOS in specialist care with close monitoring. Gondotrophin therapy provides better per cycle and cumulative pregnancy rate and uh, live birth rates compared with the use of oral anti-estrogens and or no therapy in annulatory women with PCOS. And there is no evidence of teratogenicity. And uh, it is important to note that gondotrophin therapy requires daily injections and need for intensive monitoring with ultrasound is a must with the risk of multiple pregnancy and the cost is also high. So what are the recommendations? Gondotrophins could be used as second line pharmacological agents in patients with PCOS who have failed the first line oral ovulation induction therapy. And it can be considered as a first line treatment in the presence of ultrasound monitoring following counseling on cost and potential risk of multiple pregnancy. And gondotrophins with the addition of metformin could be used rather than gondotrophin alone in cases of clomiphene citrate resistant patients. And that will also help to uh, bring down the OHSS uh, rates. Either gondotrophins or laparoscopic ovarian surgery could be used in women with PCOS who are suffering from clomiphene citrate resistance. And uh, it should be followed with counseling on benefits and risk of each therapy. Laparoscopic ovarian surgery is considered as the second line therapy for women with PCOS who are clomiphene citrate resistant with annulatory infertility. And it, laparoscopy can be considered as the first line treatment when laparoscopy is indicated for any other reason in the woman suffering from PCOS and anovulatory infertility. So the goal uh, is to achieve pregnancy, but the priority should be given for the safety. This is a retrospective cohort study, which included 567 patients, uh, which extended for a period of five years where hyperandrogenic PCOS phenotypes confer significantly lower clinical live birth rate compared with their uh, normal androgenic counterparts. And these findings may imply the need for adapted counseling and tailored approaches when treating P PCOS patients with hyperandrogenism who require ART. This is a, a systematic a randomized control trial of multicenter one. And um, it takes into account the influence of metabolic syndrome and those who are not having metabolic syndrome. And uh, it is divided into four groups, uh, the metabolic syndrome suffering people and the non-metabolic syndrome people are uh, given fresh embryo transfer as well as frozen embryo transfer. And it included 1,508 PCOS women. And it clearly says that the clinical childbirth rate with both the people suffering from metabolic syndrome and non-meds is high. 
and the frozen embryo transfer, uh, the clinical pregnancy rate is comparatively high with the fresh embryo transfers. The main thing to be stressed is in fresh embryo transfer, the possibility of OHSS is, is high in both the groups, whereas it is not so in frozen embryo transfer. So women with polycystic ovarian syndrome with metabolic syndrome have a negative impact from female fecundity, and this suggests an adverse effect on in vitro fertilization, stimulation characteristics, and clinical outcomes. In vitro maturation, that is maturation in vitro of immature cumulus oocyte complexes collected from antral follicles. There is no use of human chorionic gonadotropin, so no need for any triggering. And um, in units with sufficient expertise, uh, IVM could be offered to achieve pregnancy and live birth rates approaching those with standard IVF and ICSI treatment without the risk of OHSS for women with PCOS, where an embryo is generated, then vitrified, thawed, and transferred in a subsequent cycle. And ovarian stimulation, a gonadotropin releasing hormone, that is antagonist protocol, is preferred in women with PCOS to reduce the duration of stimulation, the total gonadotropin dose, and uh, the incidence of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. All these things are reduced when you prefer, when you go for an antagonist protocol. And human chorionic gondotrophin is best used at the lowest dose to trigger the final oocyte maturation. This will reduce the incidence of OHSS. So the choice of FSH, the recommendations are uh, um, Neither the urinary nor the rec, uh, folly, uh, rec recombinant FSH, uh, uh, both have the similar um, results. So nothing is superior to the other one. And the recommendations used in usage of exogenous luteinizing hormone, it is uh, not routinely used, but it can be used only in cases of poor ovarian reserve people, but not in hyper responders like PCOS. The use of adjuvant uh, metformin could be used before and or during the follicle stimulating hormone to improve the clinical pregnancy rate and to reduce the risk of OHSs. So the metformin commencement at the start of GnRH agonist treatment, metformin used at a dose of 1,000 to 1,000, 2,500 milligram per day and it can be uh, stopped at the time of pregnancy test, positive pregnancy test, or when uh, the menses is, uh, there is onset of menses. And um, metformin side effects, we have already dealt with this uh, um, uh, GI upsets. The ovarian stimulation for uh, IVF in PCOS, triggering the final oocyte maturation where the gondotrophin releasing hormone gene or H agonist and freezing all suitable embryos could be considered in women with PCOS with the GnRH antagonist protocol and at an increased risk of developing OHSs or where the fresh embryo transfer is not planned. And elective freeze all of embryos will help to prevent the ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Now we have to individualize. Uh, uh, the treatment protocols. For those who are having an, an antral follicle count of more than 20 and AMH more than five or six, they are grouped as high responders. And the main objective of treating such people is to minimize the ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome risk. And the GnRH antagonist protocol is advocated with minimal FSH stimulation. Whereas with low responders, you need a maximal FSH stimulation. So freeze all. We have to freeze all the uh, embryos and uh, transfer it in a subsequent cycle. That will prevent OHSs. So what is the algorithm? The first line, non-pharmacological management of infertility is uh, lifestyle interventions. And the first line, pharmacological management of infertility 
is letrozole, clomiphen citrate, clomiphen citrate plus metformin. Metformin can be added also with gonadotrophins. The second line pharmacological and surgical management includes gonadotrophins and laparoscopic ovarian drilling. The third line management could be uh, IVF or, and ICSI. So what are the adjuvants that can be added to the management of PCOS? We have already dealt with the metformin, myanacetol, and N-acetyl cysteine. So we will see dexamethasone, vitamin D, melatonin, and chromium. Uh, dexamethasone is beneficial in elevated DHEA's androgen levels. It is highly effective adjuvant to clomiphen citrate in PCOS women and should be avoided in women with diabetes. And Hello. Ma'am? Yeah, hi, Sajita. I think uh, I some network uh, issues with Madam. I will give you a call, ma'am. Yeah, okay. Uh, good evening, participants. Uh, Dr. Pachi again. Uh, there are some technical issues uh, at this speaker's end. Uh, 
so we will resume again uh, just bear with us uh, sorry for the inconvenience thank you very much Hello, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, you're on mute, actually. Uh, very sorry, there was a power cut. No, 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 it's just uh, <laughs> We I, are waiting for you. Yeah, yeah, can I continue? <laughs> yes, yes, please, yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah. Am I audible? 
yes ma'am yes yes yeah. yes yeah dexamethasone is uh, is beneficial in uh, elevated dhes androgen levels a uh, highly effective adjuvant to clomiphene citrate and pcos patients and should be avoided in pregnant in uh, women with diabetes vitamin d it influences the ovarian endocrine function and there is likelihood of uh, pregnancy there is in inverse association with the 25 hydroxy vitamin d levels and insulin resistance and the features of hyperandrogenism and circulating androgen in women with pcos melatonin it regulates a variety of important central and the peripheral actions related to circadian uh, rhythms and reproduction circadian rhythms and reproduction powerful free radical scavenger and it has a broad spectrum antioxidant property melatonin deficiency seems to be involved in pathophysiology of pcos chromium it acts as a active component of glucose tolerance factor which is responsible for binding insulin to cell membrane and the receptor sites it um, improves the insulin sensitivity it stimulates the metabolism of sugar fat and cholesterol so now we'll go to the take home message the polycystic ovarian syndrome is the most common endocrine disorder of women of reproductive age group prevalence 26% of indian women are affected and 116 women worldwide are affected there is 3 to 4% of adolescent girls who are affected and 50% of infertile women suffer from pcos the exact cause is not known it may be genetic autosomal dominant and environmental factors also contribute to them the final the primary characteristics include hyperandrogenism anovulation insulin resistance and neuroendocrine dysregulation the complications are obesity obstructive sleep apnea infertility type 2 diabetes heart disease mood disorders uh, syndrome x and endocrine endometrial cancer duration it starts in the womb and it goes up to the tomb so throughout a woman's life it is uh, she must be suffer, she has to suffer from pcos the diagnostic method or uh, ultrasound hormonal assessment like fsh lh androgen insulin and amh the differential diagnosis or adrenal hyperplasia cushing syndrome hypothyroidism and hyperprolactinemia the management it has comprises of non pharmacological diet lifestyle modification and exercise pharmacological or metformin inositols ovulogens and antiandrogens the surgical management is bariatric surgery and uh, lap ovarian drilling and infertility first line is uh, letrozole clomiphene citrate and timed intercourse second line management gonadotropins and intrauterine insemination third line ivf ivm or xc and prevention of ohs by using antagon protocols for stimulation cycles and ovulation trigger using reduced dose of hcg or an um, luprolide that is a double trigger can be used can give um, gnrh analog 12 hours prior to hcg a minimal dose of hcg that is 1000 or 2000 nash units can be used to trigger ovulation and we have to freeze all the embryos freeze all technique is best adapted for uh, to prevent ohs so to conclude obesity is not because it runs in the family it is because no one runs in the family so stay fit and healthy thank you so much for your patience listening thank you so much uh thank you ma'am thank you very much uh, this was a beautiful uh, presentation i mean all the points were covered uh there is a one question uh, ma'am uh, the species women are at the risk of uh, developing uh, gdm yeah so uh, can we continue myonositol those who are taking for pcos can we continue yeah. in gdm yeah 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 it is safe in pregnancy also you can continue myonositol and decarnitol throughout pregnancy and uh, because uh, 
they are prone to become uh, GDM. Yeah, GDM can occur in the second trimester. So if you continue this, that will act as a second messenger and uh, the patient is prevent prevented from getting uh, GDM or later in life, uh, diabetes, type two diabetes mellitus. Right, ma'am. Uh, thank you, ma'am. There is one question from uh, Dr. Kinney. Uh, the question is regarding uh, the risk of multiple pregnancy has been mentioned, uh, but what about OHSs? Yeah, that's why we are adapting the antagonist cycle, antagon protocols, and um, freeze all techniques. For trigger, we are using minimal amount of, or double trigger, or we can use minimal amount of um, HCG for trigger. Don't advocate the usual 10,000 units or uh, the recommend HCG. You can combine uh, GNRH analog and uh, HCG. We can that uh, double trigger if the fo follicle quantity is very high. If the anticipated amount of uh, oozes that you are going to derive is more, then you can go for a double trigger. And metformin has to be continued. If suppose you have uh, uh, retrieved more than twenty follicles, you better put her on uh, antagon injections daily for three or four days. And then uh, you take uh, um, gabergolin in order to prevent OHSs. So these are all the things that we advocate to prevent OHSs. And we never uh, do fresh transfers for fear of OHSs. We always freeze all the embryos and uh, transfer them in subsequent cycles. Am right. I clear? Uh, yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. Another question from Dr. Kinney only. Uh, what is the, uh, I mean, IVM is considered as a safer modality. So your opinion, ma'am. Yeah, but I, I have not practiced it. But uh, it's uh, given in books that IVM um, prevents because we are not giving any HCG for trigger. We are um, retrieving the oocytes at an earlier, uh, uh, before maturity. Only thing, the aspiration pressure has to be increased and you need some expertise to retrieve the immature uh, oocytes. And uh, all facilities to take care in the in vitro condition. So that should be there. That's all about IBM. Right, Bob. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Thank you so much. These were the questions uh, posted uh, on the chat box. Okay. So thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much for that uh, amazing uh, presentation. And uh, if you allow us, then we will go to the next uh, session. Of also. course, of course, of course. I would love to hear that also. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, so we have one more session, and as you are aware, uh, uh, lifestyle modifications and nutrition is the first line management for PCOS. So Ms. Priya Khanna, uh, who is a nutritionist and a diet consultant, founder of the Many Treasures uh, in Mumbai, and I request her to give a talk on PCOS and nutrition. So over to you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Can I share my screen? Yes, please. Do you want me to share? No, uh, no, I have shared. Yes, we can see this. Uh, first and foremost, can, can you hear me? Yes, yes. We yeah, can first hear. and foremost, I would really like to thank NSI Mumbai chapter 
for giving the, giving me this platform to share my personal experience in uh, diet management with my patients and uh, i would also like to exp- extend my special thanks to dr meena godia ma'am and dr subhadra ma'am for their constant encouragement and support and uh, thank you dr selvraj for sharing the medical aspect of pcos pcos and i will share the diet and lifestyle management of pcos so uh, pcos is a metabolic uh, disorder with serious health consequences so the goal and objective of a diet is to basically overcome hyperandrogenism and insulin resistance second is to achieve weight loss and maintain healthy weight third is to help make better food choices to decrease oxidative stress fourth is to improve metabolic and reproductive function so that menstrual cycles are regulated fifth is correcting nutritional deficiency and sixth is gradually bringing about lifestyle changes so basically diets are planned uh, based on the total energy intake that is appropriate for weight loss management goals so uh, normally the ideal distribution of a carbohydrate protein and fat in the diet is like carbohydrate is 60 to 65% protein is 15 to 20% and fat is 15 to 25% however this macronutrient distribution is highly individualized and completely based on the metabolic status food preferences and existing intake uh, food intake of the uh, patient and also the based on blood diagnostic reports so let us see the macronutrient for pcos management so when coming to carbohydrates so uh, we do we i do not stop the uh, carbohydrates completely in a pcos diet but the choice of carbohydrates are that of complex carbohydrates because that can help improve insulin sensitivity so complex food so complex carbohydrate food sources are nutrient dense and have lower glycemic index so very important to include food sources which are rich in soluble fiber insoluble fiber resistant starch and prebiotics coming to fiber so there are studies that the dietary fiber both soluble and insoluble fiber that is up to 28 to 36 grams per day can help manage uh, insulin uh, uh, resistance in pcos patients also there are other it also helps in other metabolic uh, conditions of pcos but mainly it helps to flush out toxins it helps to lose weight and it also helps to improve gut microbiome which is a very very major aspect in a pcos patient so there are a lot of sources soluble fiber as well as insoluble fiber coming through foods per se uh, like oats carrots beans uh, bananas potatoes but i also to increase the insoluble and soluble fiber sometimes i do add wheat bran to the uh, wheat so that the gluten content decreases and the insoluble content insoluble fiber increases in the diet also xylem husk at times is used for the uh, for increasing the soluble fiber intake in the diet resistant starch this is another soluble fiber and uh, this is called a resistant starch because it resists digestion in the small intestine and because it resists digestion in the small intestine there is no spike of blood glucose or insulin levels and once this resistant starch reaches the large intestine it uh, it causes bacteria to produce fatty acids and these fatty acids have several health benefits like decreasing inflammation and increasing metabolism so the examples of resistant starch is flax seeds and flax seeds normally are the mainstay of a pcos diet legumes are resistant starch rolled oats not quaker oats rolled oats which are soaked overnight also act as a resistant starch also inclusion of brown rice helps because brown rice is also a resistant starch then coming to protein protein stimulates body to produce insulin and there are a lot of studies which uh, say that uh, which suggest that higher ratio of protein to carbohydrate has metabolic advantage in management of pcos patients and it leads to better weight loss and glucose metabolism also there was another study which said that high protein diets showed considerable improvement in insulin resistance menstrual cycle regularity lipid profile and weight loss so uh, a very important aspect is to choose the right kind of protein so it is very important to include dals and legumes like green moong uh, chickpeas black gram i have specially mentioned about horse gram or pulit dal 
So this dal, we don't have a study study, but in Ayurvedic text, it is uh, it is mentioned as a superfood for women for reproduction system for women reproductive system. So maybe because it is very high, it has very high iron content and it is very rich in fiber. Therefore, it can help us to reduce high blood sugar level and insulin levels. So uh, horse gram kulit dal can be used as a soup. In uh, can be made of, of uh, made soup can be made of this dal, or it can be had as a dal itself. Also, intake of lean meats is can be allowed like chicken or fish, eggs, milks, and nuts. So coming to milk, so I advise milk uh, which has only beta casein protein A2. So there are two types of beta casein protein present in milk. And A, uh, beta casein protein A1 is associated with risk of diabetes and cardiovascular disorders. Therefore, when we choose milk, the milk has to be having a beta casein A2 protein. And because the constitution of that particular milk is closer to human milk, and therefore it is easily digested and absorbed. Soya, soya is another protein which is almost equivalent to animal protein and it is rich in isoflavones. It helps to reduce total and LDL cholesterol, triglyceride, insulin and have a protective effect against oxidative stress and also helps to reduce testosterone. However, this is a little controversial in terms of uh, soya has a lot of controversy around itself. So whenever we take a history of the patients, history of the patients, and if there is any case of hormonal dependent medical condition in the, in the patient's family, then we avoid using soya for that patient. And also, uh, uh, I, uh, even if we give soya, soya doesn't go beyond 25 uh, to 30 grams per day. And the sources of soya that can be included in the diet in, in form of soya milk and or else we can add soya atta to the rotis to increase the protein content or soya nuts can be added at, as, as uh, in between snacks or edmame beans which are young soya beans can be had as a vegetable. Coming to fats, fats are two types of fats, visible fat and invisible fat. I do recommend uh, ghee in the diet of a PCOS patient, but definitely ghee again coming from A2 milk, not from A1 milk. And uh, this ghee is rich in B vitamins, soluble uh, vitamins A, D, E, K, and is high in omega-3, 9, linolenic acid and antioxidant. Preferred ghee is one which is made with a traditional method and not cream, uh, uh, cream made into ghee. This ghee helps in building immunity, lowers cholesterol and has anti-inflammatory properties. If not ghee, then oil like avocado oil, sesame oil and walnut oil can be used for cooking, which are new for rich oil. However, we limit the intake of visible fat because in PCOS uh, uh, diets, the uses of nuts and oil seeds are very high. So we get fats from invisible, invisible uh, sources as well. So as per the IMR, ICMR guide, guideline, the visible fat should not exceed more than 20 grams per day, which is approximately two to three teaspoons. Then coming to omega-3 fatty acid. Omega-3 fatty acid also has an impact on hormonal profile, testosterone, LH, and insulin levels and inflammation. So the requirement is not very, very well established, but approximately 2 to 2.4 gram per day of ALA helps. So the richest source of ALA is flax oil, which is the richest source. Flax seed can provide us with the Omega-3 fatty acid, as I said, flaxseed remains the mainstay of a PCOS diet. Then walnuts are there, chia seeds are there, and also fatty fish is there. But, uh, uh, but fatty fish in, uh, is something that we cannot include in the daily diet. And also when a person is a vegetarian, it becomes difficult. So flaxseed is the easiest option to add omega-3 in the diets. And also, uh, uh, if the person is sometimes cannot take the powder form, then we give supplements of flax oil, which is approximately 1000 mg, uh, two capsules of 1000 mg, which comes up to two grams. Then, uh, as I said, invisible fat is nuts and oil seeds. So walnut, almond, pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds. These uh, nuts and oil, seed, oil seeds are very high in essential fatty acids. And there are studies which show that essential fatty acids have a beneficial effect on the biochemical parameters of PCOS patients because it helps us to lose weight regulate in, uh, regulates fertility, improves immune function by regulating inflammation. There is also a study on almonds and walnuts, and it says that it, it exerts a beneficial effect on the plasma, lipid, and androgen level. 
So the nut that I normally prescribe a PCOS patient is almond and walnut. However, again, the dosage of nuts cannot go very high. So we stick to the dose or dosage of 30, uh, 28 to 30 grams per day. So approximately 10 to 15 small almonds come to 15 grams and two whole walnuts will come to 15 grams. So combination of both nuts can be given to a PCOS patient. We'll be talking more about the essential fatty acid as, time, uh, as we go ahead. Then coming to the key vitamins and minerals for the management of PCOS. So uh, vitamin D is very critical uh, and it plays a very critical role in a PCOS patient because the deficiency can worsen insulin resistance men and create menstrual irregularities, infertility, hyperandrogenism, and also metabolic disturbance like obesity and cardiovascular disorders. So as we know, vitamin D has inverse association with metabolic disturbance. And also there are studies which say that vitamin D plays a vital role in folliculogenesis as it helps to uh, decrease the elevated AMH levels. However, the sources of uh, vitamin D is egg yolk and uh, it gives approximately 37 IU of vitamin D. One yolk can give that much. But also the concern part with egg yolk is the cholesterol per, per yolk is also 186. And plus it, uh, vitamin D is there in ravas, which is again an oily fish, which cannot be a mainstay of the diet on a daily basis. That's why for vitamin D, we depend upon supplementation. Coming to B vitamins, so B vitamins, vitamin B6, folate and vitamin B12 in particularly are very, very important because they help in optimizing hormonal balance. And uh, it lowers inflammation by breaking down amino acid called homocysteine, an inflammatory marker for risk factor for heart disease and reproductive factors. The sources of vitamin B6, B, uh, B6 and folate is uh, sweet potato, banana, green leafy vegetables, uh, your chana, your cowpea. And uh, the B12 comes from fish, cheese, milk and eggs. Again, it uh, the diet cannot go high on uh, these items. So we again depend upon the supplementation for vitamin B12. Also, if the gut health is not very good, then uh, the possibility of absorption of B12 becomes, uh, becomes questionable. So that's why even B12 is dependent on supplement. Since... Uh, a lot of banana, green leafy vegetable has these B vitamins and minerals. It will be a very good idea to give a glass of vegetable juice, green vegetable juice to a PCOS patient. Or we can make a smoothie, which can be a combination of banana, spinach, which can actually help uh, providing all these vitamins and minerals. Magnesium, again, a very important mineral. It, and it is very uh, important, uh, especially in insulin and glucose metabolism. And therefore, it... Uh, uh, it helps in improving fasting blood sugar levels. It improves insulin resistance and it also improves sleep quality and as well as depression. So the sources of magnesium is green leafy vegetables, nuts, seeds, sesame seeds, beans and whole grain and banana. Then zinc again plays a very, very important role in insulin metabolism and the deficiency can cause glucose uh, and uh, intolerance, obesity and hypertriglyceridemia. And the sources of these uh, zinc is nuts like cashew nuts and almonds, your legumes, your lentils, your flax and pumpkin seeds and eggs. Selenium is again an essential element against which is required against oxidative stress. It also contains some uh, insulin-like properties. So it helps to decrease insulin resistance and it also helps to decrease triglyceride and BLDL. And the sources of uh, uh, selenium is seafood, Brazilian nuts, spinach, cereal, and grains. So there is always an interaction between minerals in the body. So therefore, it is very, very important to maintain the right ratio of minerals due to its interaction with each other. So uh, magnesium basically helps to regulate zinc levels. But if zinc levels go way high to 142 mg per day, then it can become detrimental to the absorption of magnesium. And if the magnesium levels uh, are low in the, uh, in the blood, then it can impact vitamin D and calcium levels as well. Also, uh, zinc, uh, the sources of zinc like legumes and nuts are also very high in phytate. They, because of that, they, it hinders the zinc absorption in the body. So to reduce this phytic acid in food, we use methods like soaking, which reduce the phytic acid, 
or we use methods like germination which is sprouting so when we give legumes we give sprout in form of sprouts so that it, it uh, the zinc and other uh, minerals and vitamins are also easily bioavailable to the body also uh, soaking helps to decrease the phytic acid so nuts specifically the walnut and almonds we advise to soak it and then take these days we also have uh, sprouted flowers so ragi can be sprouted and then made to a flower so we can use more of sprouted flowers to increase the bioavailability of vitamins and minerals from the diet then evening primrose oil so it is rich in essential fatty acids and it include it includes omega 3 linolenic and has strong strong anti inflammatory activity it helps in elevating dysamenorrhea it improves cholesterol level and it also reduces oxidative stress however uh, this uh, 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 evening primrose is very selectively used for a pcos patient and it is not used uh, uh, very regularly only if the patient has a lot of pain while cycle during cycles or it has uh, developed lot of tenderness in and around the breast is when we prescribe this evening primrose oil and the dosage is not more than 500 mg per day and it is given as a supplement now this uh, is role of probiotic in pcos management and uh, i this is the most critical aspect of uh, pcos patients because uh, the gut health or uh, dysbiosis of the gut microbiota is associated with chronic inflammation and insulin resistance so if the gut health is good then it can help in controlling inflammation balancing hormones and improving menstrual cycles it also helps in decreasing androgen levels and it helps to maintain estrogen levels so estrogen basically gets degraded in the liver and then it goes to gut for get for its removal from the body but uh, if the gut health is not good the same estrogen gets reabsorbed by the body and creates hormonal imbalance in the body so it is very important to add a probiotic and a prebiotic in the diet so a dahi or a chhas can be a mainstay of a pcos diet and uh, if somebody is allergic to dahi then we give some give uh, give kafir kafir is nothing but milk which is fermented with kafir grains kafir kafir grains are colonies of bacteria and yeast and it ferments the milk and nowadays it is available in the market in different flavors as well also addition of prebiotic like potato onion garlic the food to this probiotic uh, bacteria is very very crucial to improve the gut health of the pcos patient coming to the role of seeds in pcos management so as we uh, shared earlier that uh, uh, the importance of essential fatty acids in uh, has a major role to play in pcos so all these seeds uh, are very high in uh, essential fatty acids and they are very very high antioxidant however the dosage per day is uh, calculated otherwise it will increase the fat percentage of the diet also so sesame seeds black and white around half to 1 tablespoon of these seeds can be used and these seeds can be added in our salads or we can give baghar with this or we can add it in gravies or also it can be used as a stuffing in the diet sunflower seeds and pumpkin seeds sunflower seeds not more than 30 grams per day uh, and uh, pumpkin seeds 1 to 2 tablespoon per day uh, sunflower some uh, sunflower seeds and pumpkin seeds are something i would like uh, uh, people to have as just snack either add in salads or just eat it like a mid 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 uh, mid meal snack chia seeds na chia seeds is also very very important uh, uh, seed and it is a mainstay of my diet and the uh, maximum uh, uh, chia, amount of chia seed is 2 tablespoon which is 15 grams uh, that can be given now chia seeds can be added in uh, uh, chia seeds can be added in uh, uh, nimbu panis it can be added in coconut water and it can be added in smoothies if nothing then just uh, soak chia seeds in water and have it in between your meals and also uh, if milk is prescribed in the milk chia seeds can be added in milk and had the poppy seeds is uh, another seed but it is not uh, 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 not uh, no prescribed quantity of poppy seeds is uh, given and poppy seeds is not something which is used uh, uh, very very uh, easily in every household so we can use it as a premix so we can make a premix of seeds and spices uh, uh, which can actually give necessary health benefits to the pcos patients poppy seeds can also be added to vegetables otherwise 
Flax seeds again is a very important uh, aspect. As I said, again, mainstay of the PCOS diet. So 30 grams per day can is allowed, and 30 grams can be normally can be had as a powder in the morning, uh, empty stomach with water. Or these flax seeds can be added into your salads, or the flax seed powder can be added into flours when you are making rotis. Then uh, coming to uh, uh, spices and PCOS. So this aspect of PCOS requires a lot of research and study even now. So uh, coming to cinnamon, so cinnamon we all know improves insulin sensitivity and uh, it can restore cyclicity and ovary morphology. So cinnamon is something that uh, we can use instead of our tea. We can replace our tea and include cinnamon tea in our diets. We can uh, have cinnamon added to your smoothies. We can have cinnamon added on your fruit salads. So dosage of cinnamon is not more than 1 to 1.5 grams per day. Methi seeds, again, the fenugreek seeds is rich in soluble fiber and contains saponins. And methi seeds is known for reducing blood sugar levels from uh, ancient times. And uh, uh, this, uh, it uh, helps to lower cholesterol, improves insulin sensitivity, it lowers blood sugar levels. It lowers ovarian cyst and also regulates menstrual cycle. So, uh, methi seeds are something that can be soaked. Uh, methi seeds can be soaked in the morning and had one glass of water of methi seed can be had on an empty stomach in the morning. And the seeds that are remaining can be sprouted and used in the vegetables or as a, as, as a vegetable itself. Fennel, fennel seeds, fennel seeds also uh, needs a lot of uh, research, but it is high in phytoestrogen and it uh, protects against oxidative stress. And it is also very helpful uh, in uh, to manage dysamenorrhea in PCOS patient. It reduces insulin resistance and it also decreases inflammation. So dosage of fennel is one to two grams per day, not to go beyond one to two grams per day. It can be just chewed after your meals or it can be added to your spice mix or seeds premixes can, that can be given to the PCOS patient. Ginger. Now, ginger uh, contains gingerol and ginger is a very, very important uh, uh, spice in which, uh, which helps to regulate the blood flow during your cycles and eases dysamenorrhea. So, uh, ginger powder is something that I do prescribe my patients, especially when they're, uh, on, uh, when they're having their uh, menstrual cycles because it helps to regulate the blood flow. And uh, Otherwise, in the normal diet, ginger can be had as a ginger tea or ginger shots may be taken after, uh, after any meals. But uh, that depends upon patient to patient. If the patient has any other uh, issues with the gut or they have gas or uh, acidity is when we decide how much to give and how to give. Ajwain carom seeds. So carom seeds is uh, rich, uh, rich in uh, essential oil, thyme oil, thyme oil fiber and antioxidant. Ajwain is one spice which is not very, very, uh, which doesn't go very well with male reproductive system. And uh, Ajwain has very high content of phytoestrogen. And uh, Ajwain, so we do add Ajwain because of its uh, anti-inflammatory properties. It also helps to lose weight. And because of, it, because of its anti-spasmodic uh, property, it can help reduce muscle cramps. And the dosage of ajwain is not beyond half to one teaspoon per day. Turmeric is also rich in curcumin. And uh, we don't have to worry about uh, uh, turmeric too much because turmeric uh, is a very, very part of Indian diets. You know, so it is rich in curcumin. It helps to decrease insulin resistance and, and it is anti-inflammatory and anti-spasmodic. So dosage of uh, turmeric is uh, not beyond uh, 5 to 20 grams per day. But uh, we keep adding it in our diets. One uh, thing with turmeric is if we add a little black pepper with turmeric, the, the cur curcumin content of uh, turmeric becomes bioavailable. So uh, we can uh, actually see that whenever we are using turmeric, we add a little bit black pepper to it. Cumin is jeera. It contains antioxidant again, and it helps to maintain blood sugar levels. It drains out harmful toxins. So that's why it is used, uh, I use sometimes for uh, look, uh, for diabetic patients as well. Saffron, again, is helps to decrease menstrual cramps. It helps in depression and it relieves PMS symptoms. 
so but the dosage of saffron is not more than four to five strands because excess can cause side effects in the system jaggery again is not a very very uh, uh, established studies with jaggery but again ayurvedic text mentions jaggery uh, for reproductive women and uh, however since it is sugar we do not advise more than 10 to 15 grams of jaggery per day so that can be added in your uh, uh, teas or green teas it can be taken with your herb uh, herbal concoctions uh, then coriander seed has hypolipidemic, antimicrobial and antioxidant activity and uh, Ayurvedic text mentions it as an excellent for uh, menstrual cramps. So this is what I have actually uh, separated uh, the spices and seeds according to their benefits. So some spices and seeds I give my patients when they are in their cycles and uh, uh, when the cycles are over, then I go back to the other, uh, other uh, spices and seeds depending upon the benefits. So this is nothing established. This is uh, just my study with my patients. Then functional foods uh, to manage uh, PCOS. So we have a lot of medicinal plants with multi potential benefits in PCOS. So holy basil is one of the uh, uh, medicinal plant, and uh, this uh, uh, holy basil can be just chewed, uh, uh, chewed and taken with water in the morning, or it can be added in vegetable juices, or it can uh, we can make smoothies out of this holy basil as well, because basil has a lot of uh, uh, good. Uh, it improves fertility in terms of decreasing the androgen production. The androgens that are not utilized because of ovulation process does not, because the ovulation process does not take place. So also the uh, S, uh, SHBG protein produced by liver is low. That is why the women have facial hair uh, growth and acne and trouble conceiving. So holy basil can help in that. So maca root powder is another uh, another. Uh, uh, super uh, food for fertility and this is something I do use for my PCOS patient because it stimulates endocrine system and it acts as a natural hormonal balancer. So I do not go beyond half teaspoon to one teaspoon of maca root powder, uh, but I do uh, use maca root powder for uh, my PCOS patient and uh, and it has uh, certain to certain extent shown some good results. Chatavari again is a natural phytoestrogen and uh, it promotes uh, normal development of ovarian follicle, follicles, it regulates menstrual cycle and it revitalizes female reproductive system and decreases hyperinsulinemia. And Shatavari is something I think normally even doctors prescribe uh, to a lactating woman, but also uh, it has good uh, role to play in fertility. Meat, muleti, which is liquor rice. So liquor rice is uh, used in form of a powder or the stick can be used in uh, to make tea, uh, uh, make a liquor rice tea. Uh, so liquor rice is also something you can either use it as a tea or you can add it in the spices and remixes so that it can go in the system. Aloe vera again is a very important uh, medicinal plant which helps to remove toxins, restore hormonal balance and insu improves insulin sensitivity. So approximately 30 ml of aloe vera juice can be given to uh, the uh, patients, to the PCOS patients. Chamomile is another uh, medicinal uh, plant which is rich in amino acid, polysaccharide, fatty acid, essential fatty acids, minerals, flavon flavonoids and uh, phytoestrogen. Cam uh, cam uh, chamomile helps to decrease uh, HbA1c and serum insulin levels. But at the same time, cam chamomile also has a calming effect in the system. So I prefer giving a ca chamomile tea at, before bedtime so that... Uh, so that a person can also uh, relax and sleep better. Ashwagandha is another uh, spice which is uh, well known to have positive effect in treatment of fertility for both males and females. Then uh, talking uh, then about coming to the lifestyle changes of PCOS, which are also a very important uh, aspect of a PCOS diet. And it is sleep and PCOS. So sleep plays a major role in a neuroendocrine function and glucose metabolism. So leptin, which is a satiety hormone, is secreted by the adipocytes and ghrelin is a hunger hormone which is released from the stomach cell. So these hormones are very high during nocturnal sleep than during wakefulness. So despite the absence of food intake, the ghrelin levels decrease during the second part of the night. 
suggesting the inhibitory effect of sleep per se. At the same time, leptin is elevated to inhibit hunger during the overnight fast. So, and the second aspect of sleep is that the brain is something, the brain is the organ which is completely dependent upon glucose for energy and is also a major site for glucose disposal. So, brain activity is associated with sleep wake and wake sleep transition that impacts glucose tolerance. So, during sleep, despite prolonged fasting, the glucose levels remain stable or fall only minimally. So, contrasting with the clear decrease during fasting or waking state. So these modulatory effects of sleep on hormonal levels and glucose regulation suggest that sleep loss may have an adverse effect on endocrine function and metabolism. The third aspect of sleep is that sleep can disrupt, uh, sleep disruption can actually impact the circadian system causing myriad metabolic ramification. So there was one study that I came across which suggested that sleeping during the day can cause weight gain, which is obesity and waking up late, that is post 8 a.m., can cause disruption in hormones indirectly affecting the menstrual cycle. So we have to really take care of our sleeping and waking uh, cycles. Then is stress and PCOS. So uh, stress can actually raise the levels of cortisol and prolactin, which can affect the normal menstrual cycle. So uh, stress is something we have to really need to balance. Exercise in PCOS, then physical activity in PCOS have shown to have good impact on improving the anthropometric measurements, insulin resistant and cholesterol, and reducing metabolic syndrome and other risk factors which are associated with PCOS. So a low gentle impact exercise, yoga, swimming, light aerobic exercises can really help PCOS patients. Then the most important aspect of the diet which I really follow is the regulation of meal timings for my patients. So eating meals and snack on regular schedule is very, very crucial because it helps to helps digestive system to keep in good shape and helps stomach to digest the food well. So regulating meal frequency and time can actually help to reduce metabolic syndrome. Uh, case, uh, I'll just uh, share one of the case study of my patients. So my patient has been uh, 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 31 years old. And uh, my patient uh, came to me in this January 2021. So she's a 31 year old and she's a strategic planner in an advertising agency. And when she came to me, her major complaints were acne, white discharge, irritable bowel syndrome, itchy palms, and sometimes constipation. And she had irregular cycles. And her last cycle was on 30th September 2020. And her blood parameters showed altered lipid profile altered lipid profile and increased uric acid. And she also had a low B12 and B3 level and her ultrasound showed bilateral polycystic ovaries. Uh, so she had a history of insulin resistance that her blood levels of insulin were very high previously, but the blood reports that were done on 5th December, 2020 did not show any, uh, were showed normal insulin levels. So the only medication she came on was vitamin D, B12 and D3 supplements. So we started the diet from 2nd uh, January 2021. The first aim of a diet was to improve the gut health of the patient. So I added a lot of alkaline food, which began with a smoothie uh, uh, in the diet, along with maca root powder. So I added the maca root powder in her diet, which was half, uh, half teaspoon initially, and then went, went up to one teaspoon, not more than that. We avoided all types of raw food and I also included flax oil along with primrose oil and I changed her oil to ghee. So she started using the A2 ghee, also not uh, uh, beyond two to three teaspoons, though, although not beyond two to three teaspoons per day. So her stomach uh, was in the first week, her stomach was better. There was no constipation or acidity, but still her little gas persist and her weight, which was 77.7 .7, came down to 76.8. In the second week, I started including spices like fennel, saffron, cuscus, turmeric, and ajwain is something I used uh, because she had gas. I also include dahi in her diet and resistant starch. And uh, her weight came down to 72.5. From 12-1 till 20, uh, 20th uh, February, I kind of gradually changed the protein and carbohydrate ratio of her diet. I started increasing the protein content of her diet, but I had to be very careful because she had IBS also and her uric acid was also high. 
so uh, uh, she got her first cycle on the diet was on 20th february and uh, we changed the spices during the period so i added the jaggery and ginger powder uh, during the cycles which was stopped immediately after the cycle and her weight had come down to 72.5 and from 3 uh, the, till then then gradually uh, i kept the diet constant and from 3 uh, 3rd march to 15th march i gradually started including more of dals and pulses in her diet and by then by this time she did not experience any kind of bloating or upset stomach but she started feeling more lighter and energetic and her weight came down to 69 and uh, her diet uh, kept constant till 20 28 february 20th march 2021 and she got her periods on 20th march exactly within one month of the last cycle and then she got it on 25th april uh, on 25th april although the clots of her uh, periods had decreased but even the flow was a little less in april but her weight had come down to 66.8 from 28 4 till 20 31 5 2021 i added soya and increased the protein intake of the uh, diet to almost 12% she is doing consistently well and without any complaints she got her periods on 25th may and this time the flow was normal now her weight is the 63.2 and she has moved from size xl to large so the blood parameters of uric acid which we did it on on 5th uh, december 2020 was 6.6 and on 11 june when we uh, took out the fresh reports the uric acid had come down to 50 5.7 mg per dl so the changes in the lipid profile were cholesterol which was 236 came down to 181 ldl cholesterol from 169 came down to 144 hdl also came down 44 to 37 was because there was no exercise happening in this lockdown period so the entire diet there was no exercise triglyceride came from 142 to 152 to 141 and ld vldl came down from 30.4 to 28.2 so this is just a sample diet that i have planned for my patients the tips that i gave my patients was not to cook in non stick and aluminium pans not to eat food stored in plastics avoid using plastic bottles for water avoid tea and coffee completely there was no ready foods or, or any kind of food with preservatives or colors that were that was allowed in the diet so uh, in conclusion i would say that pcos is a lifestyle disorder and by taking right nutritious diet and making lifestyle changes we can control the disease as well as manage the metabolic parameters and uh, these are the uh, references from where i have uh, taken and uh, i would also like to thank my uh, colleague rashi nandwani because she helped me making these uh, pres this presentation today <laughs> and uh, thank you so much uh, thank you priya thank you very much uh, that was really nice uh, presentation uh, we understood how important the diet is uh, as far as the pcos uh, uh, patients are concerned uh, let me see uh, if there are any questions uh dr selvaraj mam uh, do you want to ask any question uh mam is on mute uh so thank you thank you very much uh, um priya that was a very nice and thank you for sharing the case study as well so we don't have uh, any more questions so thank you very much for the support so uh, just a moment um uh, uh yes doctor mam uh, do you want to ask any question uh, no 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 i just want to congratulate her it was a nice pre nice presentation and very useful <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Nice, Priya. It was a nice presentation. Very nice. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much. Okay, so we are closing the webinar. So thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Priya. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Thanks a lot, Prachik. Our honor, our privilege, yeah. privilege, ma'am. Thank you. I much. I thank the Shield Firm for giving me this opportunity. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Shield, for this opportunity. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Bye bye. Good night. Bye bye.